Thanks so much, Taylor. And thanks to all of you for joining me. I know uh, pretty much everybody is in a pretty gnarly moment of their season, whether you are an apprentice or an employee or running your own operation. So I appreciate you taking the time. And um, I'm going to share my screen and kick us off here. All right. Let's get rid of some of this gray. How's that look to everybody? That looks good. Okay, sweet. So um, Taylor got in touch with me and said, you know, we've got a lot of questions from people about how they should possibly start thinking about evaluating things that come their way, whether they're their dreamy ideas or whether they're opportunities that kind of have come through the woodwork. And this is one of the my most favorite things to talk to people about. So I am a educator and a consultant, and I have been in agriculture for 24 years. And I started as an entrepreneur. I started learning, like many of you did, um, in row crop operations and, and some contiguous livestock operations, although I sort of fell in love with vegetables. Uh, until, as you can probably guess from the picture, I fell in love with also dead animals <laughs> and meat, um, but worked for many years as an entrepreneur in, in, in farming and food service operations and then sort of tumbled into becoming a consultant and that blossomed into education. And so most of what I do is spend my time teaching business and financial skills to farmers and ranchers at all different stages of their moments in, in their career and in all different environments across the United States, whether that be inner city urban environments, very sparsely populated Western rangeland environments that I'm staring at at right now. And I, but I'm based in Italy. My husband's a producer as well. And I go back and forth and I'm from California. <clears throat> so uh, this particular topic is something that is, I, I think of as a tiny little piece of big vision and strategic planning, which is my most passionate thing to talk about. And we're gonna try and not tackle huge pictures today, uh, the huge picture of strategic and business planning today and take a bite-sized look at how do I really evaluate things that are coming down the pipe at me without launching into um, maybe some of the more formal processes, right? So I just want to ground us down with a, a, a promise that we make here in this group. And then I'm going to have y'all introduce yourselves in the chat to me and each other. Um, so our group promise, because we, we may actually be talking about some of y'all's ideas, is just that we have an open, honest, and private sharing space. And then we make the pledge that all storytelling stays here and that we trust each other enough to get honest and honest with each other for these few hours. Um, working inside of livestock producer constituencies, there's a lot of chested myths, like a lot of protectionism around business ideas, business concepts, numbers. And I really invite you to move away from that historic tendency and know that you're in a safe space to just share some of those ideas because the peer learning opportunity here, here is really, really valuable. And being inside of more isolated rural environments, which you all often are, um, doesn't lend itself to that kind of sharing as openly. So thanks to Zoom, we have the opportunity now. And does everybody feel good about that promise? Wanna give me like a thumbs up? All right, sweet. So you can use the little three dots in the top right hand corner to rename yourself with your pronouns if you feel comfortable and it means, means something to you and also your place, whatever that signifies to you. It could be your place now or your permanent place or your heart place. And then I'd like to drop in the chat. We're going to just take uh, less than five minutes here. What is the relevant operation or business or idea that brought you to the table today? Why, why did you get attracted to this webinar? If, if that applies, if there's one or two, um, you know, it could be an actual operation that you're running. It could be yours. It could be somebody else's. It could be imaginary. It could be half of an idea. And um, just a couple words about what you're hoping to get out of today. So I'm going to give you all, let's say, four minutes to just rename ourselves and chat it up a little bit.
Huh. So I, I'm sitting here in three days of grazing outfit, <laughs> uh, workshop facilitation with grazing outfits from all over California. So I, I channeled your, your need here. Oh, Taylor, you too. Okay. Grazing on everybody's mind. Custom grazing. Okay. Wow. This is so perfect, y'all. I've been spending the last two days thinking just about grazing operations. Curious how do we teaching and education in the business model? Great. Okay. So folks, feel free to continue to pepper in some thoughts here about your own what you're thinking about yourself <clears throat> as we keep going. So what's our goal? How do we evaluate new opportunities? What are our opportunities? They could be products, services, locations sales channels, land, anything. Usually, I think we are sort of randomly harvesting in an unorganized manner our thoughts or not organizing them, right? So we have sleepless nights and conversations at the kitchen table with partners. We have phone call snippets and car long car rides. Sometimes we have colleagues that we are able to actually meet with in an organized way, but we, we really do need a home, a receptacle for these sorts of thoughts. And so my goal today is to give you an easy and digestible tool for evaluating those opportunities that can last a lifetime of your business. It is not specific to any style of business. It's not specific to any moment of business. And, um, and you can pull it out over and over again and use it as your pathway evolves. So if you have either been in business already um, and you have reflection and learnings to draw upon when evaluating opportunities, or you're in your first year of business and wondering where you start, or you're just sort of thinking about future business ideas that might not even be entrepreneurial, but collaborative, um, this, is, this is all for you. This, this tool is for all of you. And I just wanted to let you guys know that the provenance of this tool actually came out of a, a, a client who is also a friend and somewhat of a muse and now a co-collaborator who I'm actually here with today. I'm in Picinus Ranch in Picinus, California, south of Hollister. And um, she came to me with sort of a moment of indecision about, you know, well, I'm really evaluating this opportunity. The opportunity was actually to purchase a grazing business, an existing grazing business. But she had all these other ideas and she kind of came to the table with other opportunities and she didn't have a way of really evaluating. So she made a map and there were nine different options, things as radically different as artisan coffee roaster or stay as an employee in the grazing company or go back to acrobatics. And she had no way, she was in like an emotional tailspin and she had no way to focus her thoughts about evaluating each of these directions, which were truly uh, linked to her identity. She had lots of skills, a dense past. Um, and so we turned that, that original like drawing that she did into an, a map, an Excel spreadsheet. So that's what um, that's that's what the birthplace of this opportunity map is, and we're going to have a lot of time to talk through your questions and thoughts and sort of learn from each other. But we're going to introduce this tool to start out with. So I want to just also take a minute now to either have you drop in the chat or raise your hand to speak. 
love to have you just talk to us um, and tell us how you currently plan for new endeavors. What what kind of time do you usually put into evaluating opportunity if you've had this experience before in the past and what kind of instruments or tools or just the shape of conversations? How, how have you approached this work in the past when you have altered course in any moment of your professional activities? It can be even something as simple as like, I've decided to go back to school. You know, it doesn't have to be linked to your ag career. Um, how have you made that decision? What are some of the ways you've gone about that in the past? And y'all should just feel free to go ahead and unmute yourself and holler out or type it in the chat if that feels more comfortable. But I'd love to hear some of your voices. Natalie, I know you got something. <laughs> putting her on the spot, Taylor. She's talking. Well, I'll, I'll start and then maybe that'll get the ball rolling. But um, I had an opportunity to start a farm and I think it was like a year out. And so I got to like feel all of the seasons on another farm and sort of walk myself through what that might be like by myself. So um, I probably should have planned for longer. <laughs> But there is something to be said for jumping into it too. So I had no idea what the problems would even be. So that was the hard part of planning as I had no idea what even problems I would run into. So no real like documenting of that though, right? What do you mean documenting? Documenting of like your observations and thoughts about how you were gonna kind of go about it. Oh, God, no. Yeah. <laughs> I was like 24. And I was like, I know it, I can do it. And I just did it. And then I was, once I got into it, I was like, Oh, my gosh, I had no idea I sh should have definitely been documenting and doing a lot more research. I mean, we all do it, right? So um, big fan of doing it afraid. That is a different skill set that goes alongside of potentially not crashing and burning from just using trial and error as our only instrument, which is why we developed this tool, right? Trial and error has tons of value. <clears throat> Failure has indelible value. But making an educated decision that's based on some amount of reasoning is kind of what I promote, let's say. So, um, so we've all been there. Um, there's no wrong way to go about it, but so we've got in the chat here, making pros and cons lists. That's an awesome, awesome start. And you'll see some of that in here too. And visioning session. Great. So shy, maybe you can teach the next webinar um, about visioning sessions. Um, we like to talk about our opportunities a lot and weigh our options, maybe a little of analysis paralysis, which can totally happen too, right? A little too much, too much thought. Anyone else want to share their methods? Just drop it in the chat and we'll kind of go forward from here. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just, I'm just going to rearrange my windows here. All right. So for me, it all starts with core values. What are core values? Knowing our core values is really the place that almost every business decision I think should start inside of. So core values are the unchanging qualities that an organization or business deems most essential. They manifest in every aspect of that organization's routine in the best of scenarios. So they're really integrated into our work once we know them. And they act as a beacon for our decisions and they, and they guide our identity as a principle. Um, I believe that ethical leadership, so 
So operating from a place of ethics and a role of leadership, even if you're the leader of a one person operation is knowing those core values and having the courage to integrate them into your day to day. Um, and, and that is, is sort of, I think, connected to a common good. We outline our own personal values in order to recognize the value that we bring to a community, right? And they actually can help you make difficult business decisions. So in an ideal world, we spend some time on these core values first before we do any kind of business planning or visioning session, and then they drive us forward into designing ideas or evaluating opportunity. Um, we can go back to them to make the hard decisions about lifestyle, employees, uh, what kind of an eventual sales channel that we want to take on, um, a, stop, a new property. Those core values help drive us to say yes or no. And if we don't know them, we don't have any kind of framework, right? Um, for those of you that have gone through holistic management training, this is totally contiguous to what happens in creating a holistic context. Um, so I have a sweet little core values exercise. It's not intimidating. It doesn't take a long time. And it will end up in your inboxes tomorrow from Taylor along with the slides from this presentation and also the actual opportunity map that we're going to look at. So I've been, you know, alluding to it, <clears throat> but this map is a spreadsheet that provides entrepreneurs with practical instrument, instrument to use over and over again. And it's ideally we have a strategic vision behind it, but it's okay if we don't. And that vision starts with the core values. Um, ideally, it's a complement to a bigger visioning session, but this is really designed as a business planning light tool. Um, it's about critical thinking and research in order to make really educated choices, not just based on gut feeling and not just based on values and not just based on big 30,000 feet, 10 year vision. Um, and yet it's not a business plan, right? It's a little bit faster and dirtier. It's super flexible, right? Universal to any business model or type. And it's like a sketchbook for enterprise planning. It's a place to always come back to. And our goal is to establish a realistic vision for growth into different products and services or getting rid of a product or service before we're launching it, right? And like I said, we're trying to get rid of trial and error as our only methodology. So we're looking at things like operational ramp up needs, team delegation, leadership, very specific criteria. And I'm going to show you this in just a second. And it still does also ask for you to, to, to do a gut check. And so it's hard, hard skills that you might need, hard infrastructure, stakeholders, but also soft skills. And what are the feelings that, that you are emoting and thinking about this opportunity? And it's just a vessel. It's a home for these things. Most importantly, it highlights the information that you don't know. If you can't fill in a cell about a certain criteria, it tells you the research that you need to do. And my suggestion to you is that you're able to fill it out before you make the decision, right? And then it also is, is a uh, record keeper. So we often forget sometimes like, oh, wait, why didn't we do that again? Uh, it's shocking when those decisions are big, but we can't always reconvene a thought process and a perfect um replication of what made us make those decisions. And so it is a place to come back to and remember how we felt and why we made that decision when we did. So I'm gonna stop this sharing. See you all for a minute. Um, we've got some more comments in here. I'm very impulsive. I just tend to four things that interest me, find best practices, some more producers. Awesome, we call that competitive review and we're gonna talk about that. Seek out mentors. Awesome. Okay, so here's our opportunity map. It's not very complicated. We're gonna, I'm gonna roll through the template and then we're gonna look at an example and walk all the way through the example so you can see how it looks when it's actually filled out and utilized. And then we're gonna talk. We're gonna talk about your ideas we're going to reflect on what seems challenging in your decision-making process right now.
So we've got different enterprises and uh, or different products and services within each enterprise. So it, it can be used for something as simple as like agritourism, right? That's a new enterprise or something as, you know, like I'm going to start um, selling flower bouquets inside of my operation. So it can be big or small. Uh, one note is these criteria are developed over time from working with with ag businesses and food businesses. And um, you should feel free to change these criteria as you see fit. These are obviously what I'm suggesting you think about and evaluating an agricultural enterprise. Anything else that comes to mind, feel free to change and add it in there. This is for you to use and personalize. And that's the best sign of me being able to make something useful is that people change it, right? Because they make it their own. So room for de details and, and, and any kind of description about what we're talking about. <clears throat> As you can imagine, the more you write down here, you know, the more people you're working with, the more transparency you're able to provide, right? When you're talking through your decision-making process with not just like romantic partners or business partners, but also your employees, right? Or potential investors. Um, who's the lead? Who is in charge of this thing? And who is their team and their support? Where are you going to sell this thing? It can be a product or a service, right? Um, again, some of you are probably thinking, yourself, well, what if you don't know? And that's the whole point. This is the work that you need to do. This is the thinking work that you need to do. Where are you actually going to sell this? Are you going to sell, are you going to sell, let's say if we're talking about uh, going from whole animal sales to retail meat cuts, right? Are you going to sell wholesale? Are you going to sell wholesale to small grocery stores? Are you going to sell wholesale to a, through a third-party distribution um, service? Are you going to sell it at a farmer's market? And all of those ideas have subsequent spaces to fill in more details about them, right? Who's your target audience and customer group types? Who wants this thing? Not just your friends, who else? Convince me that there is an audience for this. What's the bandwidth and the time commitment? And that should be thought about as daily, weekly, and monthly. So what is it going to take daily, weekly, and monthly? Obviously, some of these enterprises have many different phases and stages. What does each one take? And you'll see in the next, in the example, like we're not talking about writing a Bible in each of these cells. We're talking about bullet points, just get it down on paper, get some ideas going. What is the operational or sales seasonality? Are you only selling during a season because you're only, you know, are you only selling fresh lamb because you're lambing once a year? Or are you going to have a frozen product that's going to be sold all year round? Um, launch timing, what's realistic for you to start this thing? You want to plan it two years ahead and get, and get yourself going and have a very slow ramp up. All of these pieces, <clears throat> you could see them as longer sentences and paragraphs that make up a full business plan about something. But we don't think there's always a need for that. Um, and I'd love to talk through whether any of you have a question later about when you do need a business plan and when you don't need a business plan. My quick response right now is like, if you're evaluating an enterprise and you don't know where to start, start here. If you're evaluating a bigger opportunity, like creating a business from scratch, you can still start here, but you're probably going to need a little bit more of a intense business plan in order to feel good about making that decision. And you might need it for a lender or for a business partner to be able to really describe what you're thinking about. Um, and anything is a good start. So start where it feels comfortable. Local competition, uh, looking at other producers, uh, any relevant notes about what they're doing. And it doesn't necessarily always need to be just local. I really like to ask people to look outside of their hyper-local area into their region, even though those people are not direct competitors. Then look outside of your region and look to people in other areas or states that actually are doing work that you admire and that you like and make a picture of what those companies or those services or products actually look like and what they're doing 
And that leads us to eventually thinking about, oh, well, how can I be different? Acreage, land, physical assets, space, infrastructure. What are the hard, you know, the hard infrastructure that I need to do to do what I'm talking about here? Um, then we have equipment, tools, supplies, a little different than land and infrastructure, a little bit more detail. What are the systems and logistics that I need to set up or update, right? So the, to make the day-to-day -day operations flow, what do I need? I'm selling retail cuts. I need, I'm gonna need some kind of like way to track inventory. I'm gonna have inventory. Whereas before it was just animal on land, animal out the door to slaughter, at processor sold, goes somewhere else. Now I've got inventory. Do I have an inventory system? Do I have a thought about an inventory system? Where am I going to put the things? That's an example. It could also be like, I need a contact database for the people I'm going to sell to. Estimated revenue opportunity, wholesale and direct to consumer. It just splits it out for you, knowing that these are the two main basic sales channels for agricultural products that small and medium scale enterprises actually sell their stuff. So I know you're thinking, what if I don't know? Well, let's go back to our competitive review. What are competitors selling it for? What are the prices at the farmer's market? This is about research. This cell is telling you you need to do some research. And this is back of napkin style math. This is not a this is not its own spreadsheet. Obviously, you can probably guess what I'm gonna say. Hey, if you want to start something from scratch, you probably need that. You do need some more extensive financial planning, but this gets the ball rolling and you're thinking about, is this even viable to begin with at all? Instead of saying like, oh, I just got a hundred chicks in the mail. We'll see how it pans out, right? Like where, where am I going to sell that meat before it ends up in my freezer? I want to know that there's been some estimate and some research and conversations and cold calling and discovery of where am I going to unload that inventory, right? So CapEx, that's short for capital expenditures. Those are one-time purchases, assets, and investments. For those of you who've had a little bit of financial training, those are things that live on your balance sheets, right? So they're land, equipment, and um, you know everything that you've detailed over here in L&M, bigger purchases, what's the price tag attached to those things? Like, Make a bullet list, add them up, stick them in here. You know, you don't have to know exactly how much everything's going to cost, but we need to have an idea. Is it really capital heavy, right? Capital investment heavy. Do I need a lot of infrastructure to start? Or do I need like a little infrastructure because I've got it in place, but I might need, I might have a lot of the next one, operating expenses. What are the relevant daily, weekly, and monthly expenses? It's labor, it's COGS, which stops stands for the cost of goods sold. What goods are we talking about here? We're talking about livestock. What does it cost to produce an animal? What are those inputs going into the animal? What's it cost, cost to process that animal, right? But only relevant to what we're talking about here. Um, again, they can be very big or very large. <clears throat> I mean, very big or very small. And what's our net income potential? Super basic. We're not talking about a whole business. We're talking about just this enterprise. If this enterprise that you're exploring in this chart is a whole business, then yes, you're going to have more <laughs> lines in, in your spreadsheet and you're going to uh, want to actually do some, some financial budgeting in the future. Um, but that's not this webinar. So this one's the first step. And you know, quite simply, that's 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 your estimated revenues, both wholesale and DTC, less your operating production expenses. That's your net income potential. It does not include your capital investments, right? Because that's a separate thing. Those are one-time costs, they matter, we're looking at them, but that's not our rolling net income potential. What skill sets do I need? What kind of training do I need to do this thing? Um, what don't I know how to do? That doesn't mean, you necessarily are going to be the person doing everything. It might lead you then to develop um, a larger team or just a different team or delegate something to someone else if it's not a skill set that you want to or can acquire. Random marketing ideas. Again, we're just starting to think about marketing. How am I going to do outreach? What are the actual marketing initiatives I'm going to do? That starts with who that target audience is. Who am I speaking to, right? 
what are the outside people resources and strategic relationships that I need? So this is a little bit of more of the intangibles, like, oh, wouldn't it be great to know X? Or wouldn't it be great if I could also be working on the policy change that I need to be able to make this thing function? You know, these are also sometimes quandaries, right? What's the community contribution that gets back to caring about our core values? How is it going to give back to my community? Is there some sort of value I can attach to this opportunity that it's going to give back to my context? And then we get into sort of the more, um, you know, emotional pieces of evaluation. Overall advantages and benefits. These are the things we usually think about the most, right? When we're like lying in bed or we're talking casually. And we put these last. We want to evaluate all the other criteria first, and but we're not ignoring this. Like, why do I want to do it? This can end up being what makes your decision. It's not irrelevant. It just goes hand in hand with maybe some harder research, right? And then what am I afraid of? What are the disadvantages? What are the risks? Um, when we do a SWOT analysis, you know, maybe some of you have over the years heard about what that is evaluating strengths weaknesses opportunities and threats these are the threats what could threaten it and then it's like a little scoring mechanism for my core values um does it meet my core values i've i've spent some time with the exercise i've developed some core values for my business um does it meet them and I use like color blocks just to fill them in. You could also give it a score. Some people like to give it a numerical score and then add them up. <clears throat> and in the end of the day, like that's, that's, that's about thinking style, right? So I look at all of these columns and I had to give it a one to 10 number. What would it be, right? That's just something that you can leave blank if your brain doesn't like to work like that. And sometimes when you're evaluating multiple enterprises, which people do, they stack them up next to each other and they're choosing one over another one. If you can come up with the emotional like feeling of a score, that might help you. And then we've got like your gut check, any other notes and reflections and then the decisions you make. So um, before I take questions on the tool, I'm gonna to walk through really quickly an example which seems appropriate to this group because I chose sheep, um, but I chose hand, uh, whole animal meat sales. It sounds like lots of you are interested in grazing. Um, a lamb crop is a natural byproduct of a grazing company. It doesn't have to be, you could be running a weather block, but um, so this one is, let's say I, I'm not selling meat and I want to start selling meat. And I'm going to start by just selling whole carcasses, right? That's the example that means that, 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 this, that this is speaking to. So we've got our lead, we've got our team and our support. This is a two person operation. One person is the lead and one person is the support. The support. Here's some ideas about sales channels. Wholesale would be, maybe I'd sell it to restaurants and butcher shops and direct to consumer would be through a CSA and through pre-orders at a farmer's market and friends or family, right? Um, you know, pre-orders at farmer's market, if you're not selling cuts, you don't have anything that's sitting out there, right? So this example, like me as an advisor, I might say, what are you doing at a farmer's market? You got nothing on your stand. Maybe not the best place for you to be. Run your CSA without going to the hassle of being at the farmer's markets until you graduate into selling cuts. Who are my target audiences? So we, we've we already decided who we wanna try and sell to, but what what do they want? Who are they? So nose to tail butcher shops and restaurants, chefs collaborative, chef members, so people that are already valued aligned and in, in amongst those sales channels. And then inside of the DTC world, people who want custom cuts for their meat, people who want high quality meat for less, right? Um, so here's the estimation on time. I've got to pick up the animal from the slaughterhouse. It's three hours round trip. I've got to communicate with the customers via email and phone, one hour per customer. That's 10 hours, right? Pretty simple, right? We're not talking about, it's not, it's not brain, like brain surgery here where it's really just starting to think through the basics. 
We've got something ready in the fall for some fresh sales and we're gonna freeze and sell through the winter. That's our seasonality. Is that gonna work? You know, I don't know yet. Do those butcher shops want frozen lamb? I'm gonna try and figure that out, right? By talking to them. Uh, I'm gonna launch it in fall, 2018. <laughs> it's pretty old. We should change it to 2024, just to keep things in the present. And here's some local competition, what they sell at, who are they, you know? Oh, well, here's one that I don't really know how much they sell their lambs for, but I know they're selling into a private high school on site cafeteria. Acreage and land and physical assets, you know, assets, we've got, you know, no need for freezer space as the customer is gonna pick it up directly from the slaughterhouse or from the farm on the same day as we pick it up the slaughterhouse. Um, so we don't really need that much there. I got all the equipment I need. And then I need to figure out, okay, so here's some systems like, okay, I'm gonna sell the whole carcass, but like, are they gonna be assisting in the cut sheet? The customer, are they gonna want to talk to me instead of talking to the butcher about how the animal is broken down? Do I need to walk them through that? Um, ideally, the customer picking out from the slaughterhouse in this scenario. Alternatively, we could pick it up. And then I don't know if the carcass is going to fit in the coolers. And then is that going to fall under USDA regulations or customer exempt regulations in my state? Can I transport it safely with a good solid cold chain? What's my revenue opportunity? Super back of napkin. How many head per year am I talking about selling and to which channels at what per pound price based on a little bit of that market research that I did on what other people are selling this for? I got no outside capital expenditures. We're pretty good to go on that. We've got the trailers, we've got, you know, we've got everything we need in terms of the actual production side. Extra labor for going to slaughter. And then extra cost of production on the processing side. Can I pass that off to the consumer entirely? You know, I'm not sure. Am I gonna buy in some extra feeder lambs? Maybe. And here's my potential net income, right? Our estimates on revenue, less our basic operational costs. I've got the skill set, according to me. I would push back on that and say like, you know, how good are you going to be at reaching out? Well, in this example, we're talking about 10 head. We're not talking about like all of a sudden starting a huge operation selling direct, direct sales uh, to hundreds of people. Here's some marketing ideas. We're going to use, uh, we're going to use this opportunity to maybe, you know, get more restaurants interested in our farm. We've got some hardcore meat eaters that will be appreciate being able to buy the whole carcass and break it down themselves. We're going to drop some flyers. We're going to do, do some social media. Um, we need a relationship with a slaughterhouse and processor. We need chefs at restaurant or butchers at butcher shop if we're going to sell wholesale, right? Here's our community contribution. We're gonna use the whole animal. We're not gonna have any cutting floor waste. We're not gonna do retail cuts. That's pretty, you know, it's a pretty flimsy one in my mind. Is there is there anything else that we can think about? Do we wanna set aside two lambs per year to go back to the community? Can we afford to do that? We're sure we'd like to. Um, how is what we're doing, you know, contributing to creating living wage opportunities and, you know, anything that, that is meaningful to you. And this can often be left blank. It's just a lens to think through your enterprise through to be constantly thinking, thinking, uh, through your evaluation, right. Of your own enterprise overall benefits. Easy. It's not a, not a big expense to start this. There's almost no additional operational expenses, um, and I and there's some educational opportunities there. Obviously, we're going to get less money overall for the carcass than for retail cuts. 
we could also run out of product that we could sell at market for more, you know, per pound within regular cuts. With if we went to a regular cuts option. And here's examples of some core values, right? Uh, this operation cares about diversity in their products, financial security, and connection to farm. And it hits all of those. So we gave it an eight. I'm gonna go ahead and go for it. We're gonna chart it out with one to two animals. So, uh, and see where it goes from there. So with that, I'm gonna open us up to talk for a minute about what this feels like. I'm gonna go back over to this other slideshow and have some Q and A. And here's how I want to position my questions for you all and what you start to think about to share with us. What resonates about this tool and what doesn't? What feels uncomfortable or hard or confusing? And then I'd like to get into where you think you might start. And I would love to have some of you feel comfortable starting to talk about your ideas with this group. Can we talk it through together? Can we brainstorm some of the blind spots in where you've gotten thus far in thinking about your new idea? Um, but let's start about questions about the tool itself and what resonates or not. And then we'll go into how are you all going to start and what's your big idea? So I'm going to put this prompt in the chat too. And give everybody a few minutes to gather their thoughts and then y'all can just turn on your video and unmute yourself. All right, who wants to start us off? Any reflections, confusions? I can start. Oh, it's very loud in here. Um, I guess I don't, I don't really have a big idea. So for me, looking at the spreadsheet, it seems it seems really wonderful once you have a big idea, but it also seems like there's quite a bit of details to fill in um, mm -hmm. at kind of like a very basic stage of getting into an idea or not quite knowing what it is or just kind of feeling something out. Like it almost feels like, it feels like the um, first step to creating a business plan maybe, like filling in the spreadsheet um, just with information and then piecing that information into sentences to create a business plan. Um, exactly, exactly. That's an ideal way to use it. And you may not even ever get to that business plan need depending on it, but it's a, that's a great pipeline, right? Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. I'm glad it feels useful, albeit slightly scary. There's a lot of columns. All right, so Jeanette says, it seems like a good starting point for us. We're thinking about a longer timeline to get started, but we'd like to have our values laid out so we can work with one of our friends to work on utilizing their land. Perfect. 
And then I would encourage you to bring that to the table with, to your friends, right? And show them the work that you put into thinking about it. And that can be before it's completed, include them in that process a little bit, right? This is a casual, um, comfortable space. It's not an ask, not yet. So uh, I was thinking, um, looking at the Excel sheet, it's really helpful. I, I would say something similar to something I think Natalie just mentioned. I'm at the real early stages of figuring out what it is that I want to do and trying to figure out like what I should be thinking about. So mm -hmm. my idea is I, I want to start a custom grazing operation and you know start by finding leased land and then possibly getting hired to run other people's cattle and then eventually over time building a herd of my own. So I think I've been thinking most about land access and relationship mm -hmm. building as the two mm -hmm. major parts or things that I need to figure out if I wanted to start that. So um, a lot of those things on that list were for somebody say like doing like a finishing operation or direct to market. Mm -hmm. So I think it's helpful, but seeing the outline of the different categories of the things to think about is really helpful for me. But I think um, the categories for me are going to be possibly a little bit different. Some of them are going to be the same, but others not so much. But uh, yeah, I think down the line, as I get my ideas more fleshed out, that Excel sheet's going to be pretty helpful. So yeah, thank you for sharing that. Cool, good. And you know, I would actually push back a little and tell you once you get in there, maybe a couple of those words would change, but you got all the same thing. You have an audience of customers yeah. and clients, right? You have a service to sell. You don't have a wholesale DTC scenario, but you might have two or three different kinds of folks that you appeal to, right? And in custom grazing, you know, you might be eventually taking on your own animals and running them with other people's. You might not be doing that, right? Yeah. Um, so I think it's super applicable and um, We've got some good tools for all of you all that are into um, into exploring custom grazing, some, some more refined analysis tools on the financial side. So come back at me when you need those too, for like figuring out lease agreements and um, contract agreements and fitting jobs with margins on them and things like that. So just a little side note. Thanks, Carla, for that. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. What feels um does it what feels daunting about looking at something like this? Or what feels daunting in general? What what feels daunting when you're thinking about your your big idea? Or little I'll idea. <laughs> right? I'll talk about something that's very daunting to me. So I think the opportunity map is a really great tool, um, but something that is completely overwhelming me is um, every time I talk to people about direct to consumer or wholesale with regard to butchering, uh, we're looking at like a year out. So <laughs> it's like, I, I feel like doing the opportunity map is gonna be really awesome, but timeline wise, I don't know how to lay that out to be honest because I don't have that that enterprise started yet. And so how do I go ahead and go, okay, this is how I'm gonna line it out, but I gotta look a year or two years ahead for butchering. And mm -hmm. I don't even have stock in that regard because apparently this is a big issue everywhere. Cause then I'm looking at it um, where I'm at right now, what I'm learning is talking about um, there's different lockers where you can take stock so um is it a, is it you're selling it over the state line are you selling it within the state so that determines are you taking it to a usda processing facility or is it just a locker within the state itself so that's kind of daunting mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and you're thinking about all the right things sarah you know and i think it starts with in if we're talking about finishing animals and selling meat it always starts with who is your end customer and your regulations move backwards from there, right? 
So where you're processing depends on who you want to sell to. And so that market research about who's going to buy that product in what location is going to dictate where and how you can process. And most producers go the other way. They say, well, here's the processor. And then I'm just going to sell the stuff. And so I encourage you to think about where that meat is going first and how you're going to get it into their hands and then decide on your processing as a secondary decision. And you're still going to find the roadblock. You're going to find the scheduling roadblock almost anywhere you go, whether, I mean, most places in the United States right now, there is a bottleneck that is either about time or geographic distance. That is mm -hmm. just the reality. But there's a lot of money out there that's being thrown at um, starting new processing facilities. Not sure if the, the, the greatest idea, but certainly decentralizing is, you know, a number a like hot, the top five USDA initiatives right now. So, but I'm not advocating to go out and start a processing facility if you have a bottleneck. No I one should ever do that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, way more than the opportunity map to think through that. Um, yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it. Cool. Yeah. All right, what else feels daunting for y'all's ideas? Um, funding, that's my personal, yeah. you know, um, real boundary. And actually, I did a business plan for a processing plant. Actually, now that you mentioned, don't start a processing plant. Um, and so like, like there's- Not don't some, start one, just don't start it blindly. Thinking oh, no. Like, no. oh, I'm gonna solve the problem. No, no, but like, Really, what I've noticed is like there's definitely a customer base. There's definitely a, a desire for regenerative beef or grass fed beef, but it's getting the startup so you can actually buy the land. I mean, the land prices alone are the biggest issue. Mm -hmm. Cattle are secondary. Yeah. And I think, you know, Sometimes we need to adjust our enterprise ideas based on those really basic elements, right? And I was talking to some folks yesterday that, again, sort of work work in a different direction. So instead of trying to grow their grazing businesses in the area that they are, they're sort of looking outside of the state and looking at grass and looking at climate change tendencies and looking at wild urban interface and then saying, is that a place that I could reasonably go? Because that is where the, the pieces are, you know, rather than just scaling up right where I am because I'm here and I built this here. The changing elements in my environment are telling me that I might need to go where the context of the work that I want to do is better suited, right? The only thing I'll say about that idea is I wouldn't be the only one with that idea. So it's mm -hmm. like, like cheap yeah. land only sure. exists while, while nobody actually knows it's cheap. Once people know it's cheap, they all move there. That's why every city across America is Absolutely. Rented. So I don't yeah. know. No, the opportunity map, unfortunately, does not change land values for you, no. But um, I think the goal is to look at all of the elements and give each one sort of a weight in terms of where you're putting your energy and your time and your research and your endeavors, right? And knowing that they all have a weight, they all need those, all those areas do need attention, right? They're just telling you what you don't know. And so that's where you need to put more energy, right? It's the, it's a one hour a week of research. That's great. That's what you have. Then at least you know where it's going. Anybody want to share some, uh, their what they're at, where they're at in their process and thinking about their idea? And again, it's okay if you know, you know, 
the prerequisite for this course is not like you have to be about to embark on a business idea or you have to have a business idea articulated or an enterprise idea articulated. Um, and for those of you who don't, not only is that okay, like kudos to you for prepping yourself before you actually have some big idea. But for those of you that do have an idea, big or small, um, I'd love to hear, you know, where what where you're at in your in your research and analysis about it. What have you what have you done so far? Have you taken notes and um, have you talked to some folks? Have you done some initial investigations and and what? What are you going to do next? I understand it's a risky question, but so I made y'all have the group promise that it's okay to share here. <laughs> I'll share mine. That could kick this off. It's a little different than what you all do, but uh, I decided this year that I wanted to move more um, into facilitation, which is different than consulting and education. That's a different skill set, right? It's holding. Um, not just holding space, but creating space for other people's knowledge, expertise, creativity, energy, instead of me being a face as the expert and bringing my knowledge, my ideas, and my expertise and my experience. Uh, and so I didn't use the opportunity map to explore it, but I did a lot of mapping of what that idea would mean for me. I did some like visual mapping of what resources I needed, what I didn't think that I had, what skills I don't think I had to do facilitation. Um, and, and I'm in the process of going about learning. And so the first thing I did was recruit a couple of mentors. And basically, I like sent the universe a message that I needed mentorship in this. And I wanted to know, not just from a formal, like from a fairly formal sense, not from an informal sense, like what is facilitation about? I naturally ended up doing it in some of my work. Um, and was introduced to a facilitation coach kind of in the same moment and was given an opportunity to lead this gathering that I'm at right now and took it as a risky but low consequences opportunity to throw myself into it to learn while doing, right? While actually facilitating a three-day workshop um, in a group of people that I feel safe with, that, um, that I know I could flounder with. And uh, I'm like looking into other avenues, like I'm doing research on the side. So that's where I'm at in terms of career trajectory. And that's my like little tiny idea of how I'm, you know, changing my current operation and changing my current business. So Jeanette says, we're currently in the very beginning, coming up with an idea and weighing our options. We've done some initial investigation. We're trying to narrow down what we will do. Still looking at options for land and what our product could be. Cool. Yeah, and I think giving yourself the time, amount of time and every day, week or month, whatever is realistic for you to do investigation and research is a really nice structure. I'm gonna spend, you know, so currently for myself and my new ideas for my career and my business, I've given myself a whole day a week because I was kind of burnt out. <laughs> so I've given myself a whole day a week to work on that stuff. Now, that means that I can afford to do that. I can afford to work four days a week, but I've had to work up to that 
I spent six months getting up to the place to take a day, a week to do personal business development, professional development research about the idea. And it, I don't, you know, it's not going to be forever. That schedule is not going to be forever, but it's a schedule and I have a schedule. And I started it in April and I've been able to mostly stick with it because I gave myself time to work up to it. And then I gave myself a structure to hold myself accountable for it. And so research needs structure sometimes even, I mean, most of the time. Otherwise it's like, oh yeah, I'm gonna do that at the end of all the other things. And then it's like, oh, it's Sunday night at midnight. So I encourage you all to mark out a time uh, in your week or in your month that you give yourself to work on these ideas, whatever feels comfortable. And a goal to then increase that over time. Because otherwise it really just will be like when you wake up at three in the morning and those are not productive work hours. What else? What are, what are you guys excited about? Yeah, I see Montana was saying that talking to contacts soon to explore running some livestock in combination with their current enterprises. Lots of ideas for future enterprises, many of which will require owning land, figuring, figuring out a roadmap to get there, trying to find a starting point. Awesome. Thank you, Montana. Does this feel like maybe this will help you find that starting point? Talking to contacts is 100% the you know wonderful first step. Everybody always likes to ask me, is like, oh, well, how do I get into restaurants? Like, you call them. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's not, you know, you go there, you do it in a careful way. You are very knowledgeable about what you're doing, what you're offering, what their schedule is, is what their menu is, what they're offering. You do a lot of research, but you literally are cold calling. There's not, I don't have a secret industry answer. That is what you're doing. We're talking about old fashioned research. Olivia, one question that I have after running an enterprise that has like has run its course and I've understood because I, I did the I did the method of like tossing everything into it. Let's just see because I have no idea what what's going to happen. Um, I sort of got limited by the fact that I didn't have the capital going into it. I didn't have a lot of wealth. I didn't have um, okay. some tech job that helps get a lot of people into farming, starting their own farm business. And so I kind of felt like I was stuck in my systems because I just never had that capital mm. to, pr to propel myself forward, like to buy that bigger, um, you know, chicken tractor that can that can run multiple hundred birds instead of these tiny little things I built with two by fours. Like I, I kind of got stuck in that cycle because we were always making just enough money to get us through, but never enough to like stack it into the bank and then propel ourselves forward with capital. So I kind of thought about, well, what if I just, what, what if a different approach is just working another job for a while, getting a bunch of savings and then going into this? Is that such a bad idea or like? Not a bad <laughs> idea at all. Um, my question for you Taylor is, did you sit down and figure out at all what you even could estimate you would need in any given quarter or season or year of operation? I had no idea because I was like, how much does a chicken eat in a, a day? Right. You know, or like, I didn't even have shovels. So like, I had to go buy shovels. I had to go buy right. like screwdrivers and like drills and yeah. saws and like all the stuff I took for granted working for other people. We, I was like, holy crap, we're buying like pens like yeah yeah <laughs> to totally. buy like a computer to like do the my i had to buy quickbooks for the first time and i did like everything was from scratch so all that stuff added up so much that i was like holy crap i've put so much into this i don't possibly understand how i can dig myself out by selling chicken you know right, so right. so i feel like i needed that initial pot of money to start with that's um, a it's definitely something that helps to start with and just as powerful as the actual money is some estimate. Mm -hmm. So I just encourage all of you, I don't 
I, it doesn't matter how intimidated you are by the process or whether you like Excel or not, you can use a piece of paper, sit down and do a bunch of estimates, right? So I started a restaurant never having worked in a restaurant. Like <laughs> I never even had a waitressing job. And we, uh, I mean, my business partners built a 140 seat restaurant from scratch and ran it contiguous to our farm. And it was literally like a, a spreadsheet that started with like, like oven. Forks. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> like, forks. Yeah. And then we'd like literally just go do some research about forks, a bunch of research. And we spent a year collectively with maybe two to three of us doing tons of research on things like forks and things like paint. And like things change, but at least we had a baseline. And if you don't do that first, then there's no way you can successfully find money, whether it's your own money, debt, credit cards, the auntie. If you have no idea what you need and you haven't taken the time to do any kind of basic estimates, then you have no way of doing anything but probably failing, right? And so once you have some sort of an estimate on what you think you might start with, then we look at the lowest hanging fruit possible, right? So the idea in terms of access to capital that we always present is like, who is directly around me in my community that I feel comfortable having this conversation with, not knowing how much money they have, not knowing how much they give, but who is, who is in my immediate circle that I could talk to about this? Um, and, Friends and family is rounds of fundraising is usually the sort of start of how fundraising gets going for most people. And that can look like $3,000 loan from a friend that you pay off in two years, you know, at some sort of low interest rate. I, this session, I don't want to get too much in the weeds about like fundraising strategy. And there are lots of people that I would love to create that, you know, roundtable discussion about if Kavira and Nap is interested in that. But um, my role here today is to tell you, just start putting some ideas on paper and spend the time each week or month talking to people that do that work already to get those estimates. Go to Lowe's with a notebook and write down how much screws fast. Literally, like actually if you don't know, right? Um, sorry, if that's not a fun answer, Taylor. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, and I, yeah, I feel like I should, yeah, I, I think it was helpful to, um, something that was helpful, I feel like we did do well, is like, we asked the someone we knew to run, we ran one batch of chickens in their pasture. And you know, mm -hmm. you take you actually build the chicken tractor and you understand how many screws it took and how much chicken exactly. wire it took. Right. And so you can kind of get rolling a little bit. Yep. So yep. Yep. But and then you know, going to five different farmers markets in the region and seeing what chicken's being sold at and estimating what you're gonna do your first group at without killing yourself if you don't know what you're doing and then estimating what that's going to be you're going to be at a loss that's fine but at least you're starting somewhere knowing mm -hmm. and i see natalie put a, a mm -hmm. comment that's getting some attention in the chat is she says yeah. i have access to land opportunities through various relationships but i'm paralyzed by lack of capital skill set some of the land desperately needs sheep but i only know cows and most of all, fear of taking on that much risk when I've been working for people and getting paychecks my whole life. Awesome. Thank you for being honest and transparent with yourself and with us, Natalie. Um, I do think of fear as an asset. It ends up being the things that teach us the most in the end of the day. So this is about perspective and finding the motivation to work through the fear is recognizing that that fear will bring you opportunity. It will bring you success and failure. And both of those things will encourage deep learning and that will increase your capacity. That is like an optimistic, very like, 
particular perspective. I don't think you can be an entrepreneur without that perspective if we're talking about entrepreneurialism. That is a skill set and an asset that you can grow in yourself is your perspective on that fear. Do you want to go back into that dark hole all the time? No. I mean, I spent so many days like in tears that I bet you all have as well. And those moments like, do I really want to relive them? No, I never want to relive them. But I do recognize their value. And um, they did give rise to me having resiliency and doing many other things in my life that I would not have been able to do without the, that fear, you know, sort of motivating me. So that's one piece of an answer. Um, great. You only know cows. Where are the sheep people? Where are they? Start talking to them. Like, start figuring out whether you can work with them or not. What do they need? Um, and taking the leap to not having a paycheck that's paid for by somebody else is never going to be simple. And there's no way to gloss that over. And it's not for everyone. And so where we start is like your core values. If you're, if one of your core values is ultimate financial stability, because you have massive personal debt and health instability inside of your extended family. I'm not going to try to convince you to like go be an entrepreneur unless you can convince yourself that there's all these other reasons that you want it. It's okay to not do that, right? It's okay to want a paycheck. And every one of our situations is very individual and very, very idiosyncratic. I also in dealing with producers who have gone into entrepreneurialism, like head forth, like full blown without analysis and without research and without money and tumbled through it and then kind of crashed and burned. It, for those people backing up out of entrepreneurialism or, or leaving farming is a success story. And I know that's not the message that the Kibera NAP program is promoting because we are trying to get you into agriculture. But I just want to give you all permission to leave if the moment is right, because that is also success. If that is not right for you, especially on the entrepreneurial front. And I do think that what we're trying to do sometimes is fit into this like very well ingrained capitalistic structure that it is okay if we can't participate in. So this is the therapy side of my work. It is not the hard answer. I'm not gonna tell you where to find that, that capital. I mean, I can do that too. There's lots of other webinars I can point you to about finding capital in creative ways. I want you all to feel very free to email me about whatever it is that you want as you know another um, piece of this moment. Um, but I do not want to ignore the emotional sort of the emotional skills that it takes, takes to confront that fear and the benefits that it has also. Um, yeah, maybe you want to work with some sheep. There's also another, um, comment from Kaylee saying, love the spreadsheet tool you presented here. I like that it has space for multiple enterprises. It is daunting to imagine the amount of research needed to accurately fill in some of the columns. I would also consider adding a column for synergistic opportunities between enterprises. My family recently bought 40 acres in Dolores, Colorado, and my partner and I would love to run sheep for meat slash dairy. We are in the planning phase until we are done with our full-time jobs in the winter. We are only three tree there are only three trees on the whole property, but I still have a dream of silver pasture systems with tree crops, fruit slash fodder. I think I have a tough time narrowing down my ideas and being realistic about what I have time slash money for in terms of multiple operations. It seems like this spreadsheet and its incorporation of core values might really help with that. Cool. Awesome. Good. I'm glad it feels that way. And yes, narrowing down ideas. Put all those ideas in here. This is the home for the ideas. Nobody else is looking at this. 
uh, get part of the way through some of those ideas, you know, put, put them into the, um, the hopper, let them like roll around a little bit. You know, nobody's, this is not a, a homework assignment. It's not for a bank. It's not for a potential investor. It's just for you. Olivia, would you recommend just starting with one thing first and then diversifying? Because I feel like that's another sort of model oh, you mean that like we see. In your, actually, in your actual enterprise? Yeah. I think that's really uh, about land base and skill set and passion. So mm. you gotta evaluate those three things, right? Um, well, alongside existing, existing opportunity and in infrastructure, right? So if you are given a piece of land, because it is in your family, you need to address what that land is speaking to first and foremost, instead of just saying, I'm gonna do a Dahlia tuber farm, right? That's great. You love Dahlia tubers, Dahlia tubers love you. But if you're gifted a land base, you need to read the land base in order to take that enterprise planning to an effective space. If you really wanna be a Dahlia tuber farmer, you could also sell that land if that's not the right land base for it. Lots of times we're trying to put the square peg into the round hole or whatever that idiom is, right? So you guys know better than me what reading that landscape would tell you, right? Because I'm not a production expert. And that is a skill set that you are growing and that you have. And so evaluating that along with what <clears throat> resources do you have alongside of your core values and your and your passion meaningful right just as meaningful um so there's no formula like start with one here's what you don't want to do don't start with like six okay we put that way you will drive yourself crazy if you start with like a lot of enterprises at once and a lot of small farmers tend to diversify because I think we're all trained in this methodology that stacked enterprises and, and diversity in enterprises, like a la Joel Salatin is the way to go. It isn't always the way to go. And I talk to a lot of people that are adding things because of opportunities being thrown at them. And that's exactly why we built this thing. It's like, okay, just think through all the things. Um, you know, my current example is like a farm that I've been working with for a little while and they're super smart and they have an incredible incredible customer base they can sell anything they put out there like in in minutes they just have they have market cachet they have access to metro, metropolitan area with wonderful buyers they have a wonderful reputation so they just keep like adding enterprises and they're good farmers and they're resourceful and he's also a carpenter and can work construction so like everything seems like they can do it all right and it's too much stuff. It's just it's just too many enterprises. Like I get it, they can do it, but how is it benefiting the farm? They can sell the bunnies. The bunnies were only X amount of dollars, but then six months later, it's like we're getting rid of bunnies because it's just too much. So I think a lot of y'all get real excited on the animal front, and um, I can understand that. And we we you know. There's a, there's a, just a delicate balance between like what we're passionate about growing and what a certain land base wants to carry and what a business can render. And most people are doing what the business can render in a half-assed way or not at all. And I'm just saying like, hey, include that, you know? Not because it's more important, it's equally as important. And it's not a natural skill set that producers have or are taught. You know, and it's intimidating. I mean, I don't like math. I don't do math. So, but I appreciate that without numbers, I had no way of evaluating my businesses. And I learned that the hard way, you know. And then I was like, oh, wow, numbers are just another language of evaluation. It's just one. And profit is just one currency. Right. It's an important one, but it's only one. Yeah, I think too, in, in terms of talking about like, is everyone an entrepreneur and should everyone, should you be an entrepreneur? Do you have, I think one thing I learned too is like the business side of things was 
it's like it was so much more important to learn those skills and understand because exactly what you're saying like because some enterprises aren't working and you don't know that they're not working unless you have numbers and so and it took some so a little bit of organization to understand that so um olivia before we wrap up um do you have any resources for folks that are learning to develop their sort of entrepreneurial or business and if you do later i can send them out and mm. to all the registrants but sort of like we're all coming at this because we love cows and sheep and goats and chickens but do you have any sort of resources about entrepreneurship or yeah. business building yeah businesses? why don't i send that in the follow-up taylor and um go ahead and send out the other stuff that we have i'd say okay for, for everyone here just so you all have it in your hands you know, tomorrow, and then I'll send a follow up with some business resources. Um, I have a couple of different lists that I usually uh, send out to people, but I want to make sure I want to look it over again, specific to this group before, you know, sounds good. I send it out and make sure there's not any particular ones that I feel like are useful. Awesome. Well, does anyone have any last questions while we have Olivia? I'm going to, I'll share her contact so you can Sorry, always... I just put it in the chat. You guys are okay. welcome to email me. I will always answer your emails and questions. <laughs> yep. Any last ones before we go? All right. Well, thanks for coming. Uh, our next, uh, our next webinar is called Teams That Thrive. So we're going to talk more about the social side of uh, team dynamic and um, how to leverage those to be a good thing and those so um, really interesting conversation that's going to be on August 2nd um, but in the meantime it's great to see you guys and I hope to see you soon thanks you all for your participation and your presence and good luck to all of you and please be in touch all right take care everyone see ya bye God